check the contour. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Thank you for coming and joining us at the premiere of our short film on this side of the web. So this is a community-led project where we co-created uh, a short film taking footage and knowledge created by our community. We are Digital Grassroots, we are a youth and female-led organization. Uh, we work remotely to connect young people in underrepresented communities to internet governance through courses that we do and also through networking and mentorship. So we're here today to just have a look at the work that we've done and share it with you all. And also just as an opportunity to share this with our community here at the Internet Governance Forum and contribute to the discussion on what does localizing the internet really mean. Uh, the format of this session will be five minutes of our introduction, which is happening now. And I know there are people joining us online. So thank you to everyone who's come. And after those five minutes, we will have a 30 minute short film. So we'll be watching it from the screen there. And then we'll have 10 minutes of an open discussion of what we've heard. And that, that will be it for today. I'll be passing it to Ufa. Uh, I'm Esther Wema, the founder and chief strategist of Digital Grassroots and passing it on to Ufa, the co-founder and global lead. Hi everyone, my name is Ufa from Nigeria. I'm Digra, co-founder and global lead. Um, this short film on this side of the web is uh, one of our community-led projects aimed at enabling us to amplify the voices of the young people within our community to enable them to share their thoughts, suggestions, opinions on internet issues that they encounter in their local community. The project was done in 2021 and through this project we have been able to we asked them questions and got them to respond to the questions and also um, put all of these things together with our own research from the issues that these kind these young people faced in their communities which related related to the internet um, it's a 30 minutes 
long short film and um we hope that you'd enjoy it but we are 100 percent open to all of your thoughts comments suggestions and opinions it's still a work in progress it's not yet been finalized and we hope that the feedback that we get from you today would be used to make the next version of this short film so thank you very much once again thank you we can show the video now We need it. We believe that the internet is open for everyone. As long as you and I, or any other person that connects to the internet, has a space at the digital level. the internet in a meaningful way or in a responsible way because the internet is created to bring people together decentralization is very important because that would help to bring the mass of people together and help to bridge that gap Lives. The common denominator is that all of the stakeholders have realized that to build a truly sustainable digital global economy, there needs to be a lot of heavy investments into ensuring that the next generation of citizens, which are the youth, are equipped with the right skills to excel in the digital future. So we have seen a lot of efforts go into providing ICT training and skills development for youth in underrepresented regions in order to aid their inclusion. Is this enough? Well, digital literacy goes beyond knowing how to write code and deploy tech infrastructure for ICT. More and more, we have seen that apart from having access to sophisticated bits of telecommunication technology, especially internet technology, there is still a lot of work to be done in ensuring the safe adoption of the technology globally. How do people make use of the network? What is the general attitude to it? Do the people know not to use the technology as an enabler for human rights abuse relating to censorship, cyberbullying, surveillance, freedom of expression? What power structures can be dismantled from adopting decentralized nature of the internet? Do the developers of the tech understand the core principles of the network relating to privacy, inclusion, and openness? And do they instill this in their design? Are you a digital citizen? Hello, my dear. Uh, can, can you please explain more of the question? Digital citizen means someone who uses internet to help their country or their community or to help themselves in doing ICT things which uh, uses internet. No. You're not? Okay. Are you a digital citizen? We can't hear you. There's no audio. Okay. Do you know who a digital citizen is? Uh, I don't know. Uh, are you a digital citizen? No. Are you a digital citizen? Mm, no, I'm not a digital citizen. What do you mean by digital citizen? The history of internet architecture begins way before we knew the potential of the technology to change the society we live in. From the 1960s, when scientists and researchers led the conceptualization of TCP IP, which began as a research project, to the industrialization and commercialization which shaped the internet that we know and use today. 
This process was informed by the fundamental principles of open technical standards, fully accessible processes for technology and policy development, transparent and collaborative governance, and distributed responsibility for technical management and administrative functions. These considerations have defined the foundation for internet technology, management, community, and commercialization that is used today. Presently, as we work towards developing a healthy internet, we must recognize the voices of marginalized and underrepresented communities. It will be impossible to achieve a truly universal internet without attaining distributed ownership that stems from ensuring that all internet users are involved in processes that shape the digital future. Around the globe, users from underrepresented communities should understand the core policy principles of the internet, such as those highlighted by Internet Society. This includes our ability to connect, speak, innovate, share, choose, and trust on the internet. This way, we may develop the required skills to connect to the broader national and international policy environment. We will also learn the best practices involved in engaging safely with the digital world. What digital inclusion issues are faced by young people in underrepresented regions? Well, there are many, many issues because these are the main internet users. They, they suffer from lack of access, expensive internet subscription rates, and expensive devices. Low internet speed in the era of 5G. Poor local online content, so people who only speak their local language will not find a relevant content. The need to acquire digital skills because they're not more a luxury. Uh, and the need to know that the internet benefits are far beyond only using the social media. The huge gap between the traditional and non-flexible education the youth receive and the digital transformation we are living. The lack of platforms where youth can have their voices heard, and of course, online discrimination, bullying, harassment, being a target for online fraud and cyber attacks. Digital inclusion can be considered as a strategy that ensures all people have equal opportunity and appropriate skills to access and benefit from digital technologies, especially the internet. Digital inclusion practices, on the other hand, encompasses a range of methods and approaches that can be used to ensure that individuals as well as communities are able to access and understand what digital technologies are. The internet, as you know it, is the most widely adopted technology in the world. Its universal acceptance, however, has not yet translated to its integration in the education system with only 10% incorporation in developed countries. This fundamental challenge has led to a skill gap in computer and web literacy amongst the youth, leaving the probability to succeed online on knowledge that they do not have. Access to ICT facilities is still a challenge in most African countries, with a 1 to 150 ratio of computers to students against a 1 to 15 ratio in developed countries. In Kitui, where my community is based, the situation is made even worse due to lack of electricity in schools that fall in areas outside the national electricity grid. Most schools are still unable to obtain computers for their students, despite the generous donations from organizations attempting to bridge that gap. Even so, schools that have computers lack internet access due to the high cost of connectivity involved. Les jeunes des communautés sous-représentées ont besoin de l'outil, ont besoin de l'outil, ont besoin de l'outil, ont besoin de l'outil, ont besoin de À la gouvernance mondiale, à la gouvernance mondiale, la présence de l'Internet désigne tous les acteurs qui ont consolidé leurs racines dans l'espace numérique. Il s'agit notamment des gouvernements du monde entier qui utilisent la technologie pour développer leur économie nationale, des grandes entreprises technologiques qui monopolisent le secteur privé des titres et même des individus qui sont à la pointe du développement de l'économie numérique mondiale. Ces acteurs de l'Internet reconnaissent progressivement le rôle que les jeunes ont joué dans la gouvernance mondiale de l'Internet et certains d'entre eux font même l'effort de s'assurer que les voix des jeunes du monde entier 
soit prise en compte. Il aussi s'agit de la gouvernance de l'Internet et des droits numériques. Ces efforts existent clairement, même si les résultats à long terme ne sont pas toujours visibles. Cela soulève des questions. Ces programmes sont-ils suffisamment intentionnels Comment perçoivent-ils les communautés de base Quels sont nos besoins selon eux Comment se relier à nous Parfois, l'assistance fournie ou l'aide apportée est simplement hors de portée et peu fiable pour ceux qui ont le plus besoin. Il faut que ce soit, soit une approche ascendante plutôt que descendante. Par exemple, les principales voies qu'un certain nombre d'organisations Internet ont explorées pour permettre l'inclusion des jeunes dans, le, dans la politique technologique sont les programmes de bourse pour aider les jeunes à participer aux réunions de politique publique sur Internet. Est-ce que c'est suffisant? Outre la simple participation à ces événements, existe-t-il une approche manuelle permettant de s'assurer que les jeunes y participent de manière significative? Existe-t-il un environnement sûr, sécurisé et favorable qui encourage les jeunes à participer, à partager leurs pensées, leurs opinions, leurs questions et leurs commentaires? Qu'en est-il de faux mots et des nombreux acronymes que les nouveaux arrivants ne comprennent peut-être pas entièrement? Qui est chargé de veiller à ce que les concepts fondamentaux de la gouvernance de l'Internet et des droits numériques soient parfaitement clairs pour ces jeunes? Is there a gap between funders, mainstream internet actors, and grassroots youth, and why this is so? Of course, there is a gap. It's because of many reasons. Youth grassroots will not receive funds unless they have a good business plan and a clear vision. The leaders need to know how to pitch their ideas and have amazing communication skills. They also need to well use their social media channels to spread the word about their activities and the latest updates. So unless youth uh, have the opportunity to network with the donors or funders online or offline, they will not have access to these opportunities. It, it will be very hard for them to get, to get these grants. Also, the grants and funds should be open for everyone and made public without targeting specific organizations. And of course, the announcement should be made in, in different languages. Youth can be aware of such opportunities. Local language is Tabanguti. How we can get more content uh, in, in our local languages is with Tabanguti. Maba post. Let's use more of Isuzu. I remember the other day I was on Facebook and I tried to. You know, there's a function here, translate. And they don't have I'm a translation wait. But they'll translate Spanish, they'll translate French. Because there isn't a lot that's been said in, in our own home languages. I mean, for the fact that I'm doing this video in, in English, it's a problem. Mean by a digital citizen, eh? But love of internet is small, but then you go to Mujapata Sara in the Gate. I am a Yeva Dangi, Umar Kaka, and the Yaki of low internet pool of that small girl. Kwa sababu tumezoea tu tuna tunaiga lugha ya Kiingereza na watu wengi tumezaliwa tumetokea vijiji mbalimbali tofauti makabila tofauti tofauti 
Unakuta mtu amezaliwa ame huko, amekulia huko na hanajua viga mama tu. Wakozi chini cha mbere kuri cha cha korwa nuko mbere na mbere dukundu mucho wa chuni juu gundi sio nuru mirgua chuo. Tukajaribu kutoa dukoresha mje turi kwa ndi kwa kuli zonvuka kwa nyambaga kwa kwenye chuo tu kira wanyarwa nda mbere yuko tu kira wanyarwa nyama. The foundational work of bridging the digital divide is not new, and this work will continue further into the future. The groundwork has been laid by key organizations in the internet ecosystem, which offer great reference and details on the need to connect the divide. Five examples of these are UN, Article 19 on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It states, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. UN Secretary General's High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation It states, The Secretary General of the United Nations, UN, appointed this panel to consider the question of digital cooperation, the ways we work together to address the social, ethical, legal, and economic impact of digital technologies in order to maximize their benefits and minimize their harm. In particular, the Secretary General asked us to consider how digital cooperation can contribute to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. The ambitious SDGs. agenda, the ambitious SDGs. agenda on the planet endorsed by the 193 UN member states in 2015. He also asked us to consider models of digital cooperation to advance the debates surrounding governance in the digital sphere. Web Foundation, Contract for the Web. It states, everyone has a role to play in safeguarding the future of the web. The Contract for the Web was created by representatives from over 80 organizations, representing government, companies, and civil society and sets out commitments to guide digital policy agendas. To achieve the contract's goals, governments, companies, civil society, and individuals must commit to sustained policy development, advocacy, and implementation of the contract text. APC, the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet. It states, the internet is a global public space that must be open affordable and accessible to all. As more and more people gain access to this space, many remain excluded. Like the process of globalization with which it has been closely intertwined, the spread of internet access takes place with uneven results and often exacerbates social and economic inequalities. However, the internet and other information and communication technologies ICTs, can be a powerful tool for social mobilization and development, resistance to injustices and the expression of difference and creativity. Africa Internet Rights, African Declaration on Internet Rights and Freedoms Initiative. It states, much of the effort to regulate the internet and online activities appear to replicate some practices from other countries which do not protect and promote human rights in relation to the internet and digital technologies. The tendency has been for many African governments to take problematic laws from other countries or other regions and apply them with few or no changes. Invariably, the context and local conditions in the countries where such laws have been adopted are very different from those where the laws were originally developed. In addition, the policy and legislative processes in most African countries lack meaningful mechanisms for inclusive participation, with the result that many critical stakeholders, particularly from civil society, are frequently excluded. These are only five examples of the work that has already been done at a high level in order to bridge the digital divide. We must pay caution, however, that even as we strive to connect the disconnected, we must recognize that not everyone wishes to be connected. This does not mean that we must not take consideration of the choices of these individuals or communities, but rather, the option for connectivity must always be available regardless. In bridging the divide, we must accommodate those who intentionally choose not to be connected and want to abstain from digital inclusion whilst protecting the cultural values and integrity 
of the ones who simply cannot be online as well. The youth have brilliant ideas that could be capital intensive. More often than not, funders are willing to support them. This, however, only accounts for 12% of businesses that receive donations and grants, the larger percentage consisting of the youth who are unaware of the available funding or job opportunities, which are mostly communicated online. This is due to the fact that they lack smart devices that can access the internet, and also those who are located in very remote areas lack electricity or even internet connectivity. And those that have internet connectivity have limited knowledge on how to maneuver online and where to obtain trustworthy information about the funding or job openings. Digital entrepreneurship comes with credibility concerns for both the funder and the youth, in this case, the digital entrepreneur. A first-time internet user might not be aware that scammers are masquerading as legitimate funders and as a result may provide personal information that could be used in cases of identity theft. Without a platform or method to verify that both parties are who they say they are, the youth end up feeling discouraged from seeking online opportunities due to the fear of being hacked or their information being stolen. As we all know, network coverage is critical for internet access. About 85% of the global population is covered with 2G, while 55% is covered with 3G mobile signal. The economic case for internet providers to expand their network to rural areas is a challenge because of the high cost of maintaining and powering cell sites that is involved, as well as the low revenues expected from the thinly spread population. To tackle this challenge, internet providers can consider using renewable energy sources to power the cell towers and also investing in coverage solutions that do not involve the construction of permanent infrastructure, such as the use by those that were launched by Google. For the youth in rural areas to contribute towards the growth of the digital economy, they require digital skills that will enhance the adoption and use of the internet. The government can support this by facilitating the inclusion of web literacy in school curriculums. What will it take to bridge the digital divide? We could throw money at it, but that solves only half the problem. We need to be intentional and realize that the structural violence that keeps young people, women, refugees, persons with different abilities, and common folks out of internet governance processes is really a reflection of the offline world we live in. Internet is no longer a luxury. It is a basic necessity and must be treated as a public good. The digital divide is really about a concentration of power, a new sphere of existence where the rich get richer. Women and young people are treated like second class citizens. The neurodivergent and persons with special needs are silenced, violently excluded from systems that are shaping the world we live in. The disconnected, it's like they don't even exist. The internet lacks borders, but rural urban gender education and geographic differences are creating new and accumulated inequalities online. The internet is like a wooded sword that produces both good and harm, except that this power is wielded by an elite few. We're coming to a time where corporations want to stealthily own the internet and governments are itching for control. No one should own the internet. No one should control it. It's like living in a rented house and the price for it is your blood. Online, our lives are for sale. So what can be done about it? What are we going to do about it? The decentralized nature of the internet offers great opportunity for democratic participation in internet governance processes. This strength, however, also gives way to challenges of accountability on who is responsible for bridging the digital divide and how. Without collective multi-stakeholder targets at local, national, and on the global stage, what we see are fragmented efforts to bridge the digital divide. In this way, the most vulnerable are left out. One way to address this is through grassroots investments. Grassroots investments are concerted methods to give the most marginalized equity to participate in internet governance. This can look as foundational as improving access to electricity, water, and sanitation, because we know that these basic needs are hindrances for participation in the digital economy, 
especially for women and girls. Another way that is not immediately obvious is providing competent psychosocial services to communities and people who have been violently excluded from systems that shape our world, whether through prohibitive cultural norms or a hostile online culture against this group. This holistic approach to addressing the digital divide will, in fact, make the internet a healthier place. Notwithstanding, the educational system must be updated with lessons on digital literacy in addition to ICT. The work done by civil society should be adequately funded. We must fight a colonial lens that holds a biased mindset against young people and individuals from communities in the global south by falsely asserting that these groups are not competent enough to know how to solve our own problems or use resources diligently enough to be trusted. Grassroots investment must lead to ownership in infrastructure. Much like the global financial market, internet infrastructure is centralized in the United States and the West. Top tech companies like Alphabet, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, and Amazon are making more profit than the amount of money required to connect the entire continent of Africa. What then will the world look like a decade from now? We cannot underplay the role of the private sector in commercializing and industrialization of the internet. It does cost money to breach the digital divide after all. Community networks are one way of ensuring ownership in internet infrastructure. Projects led by organizations such as Internet Society and Tunapanda Institute are proof of the positive results that come from connecting hard-to-reach places. Ownership in infrastructure gives citizens better access to shaping policies that influence their online lives. It also makes legislation easier because infrastructure will be within the legal jurisdiction of a respective region. When entire regions do not have data centers and infrastructure within their jurisdiction, it disenfranchises entire populations and gives power to corporations. When thinking of the future of the internet, we must inform ourselves on the risk that this holds for us and future generations. Ownership in infrastructure involves citizens knowing their rights online, clear processes on how to navigate and get justice for harms done online, affordable access to internet, strong bandwidth even outside urban areas, having a basic idea of how the internet works, and being able to meaningfully participate in internet governance processes because it is clear how to get involved. Ownership in infrastructure is only possible when there are intentional inclusion mechanisms. And infrastructure goes beyond the tech. It also means clear pathways for people to get involved in internet governance, with priority given to the ones who are most excluded from decision-making processes in society. It is clear that the people who are able to participate meaningfully in internet governance represent a privileged class that can afford the hardware such as phones, the software, the skills, training, the internet, and indeed the extra time required to contribute, especially if contributing on a voluntary basis. While experts that work in this field are pushing to bridge the digital divide, it is imperative that we recognize that having the same faces, saying the same things year after year only creates a counterproductive echo chamber. As a public utility, it becomes invaluable for internet governance processes to center the voices of the ones who are pushed to the margins, young people, women, persons living with disabilities, indigenous groups, the neurodivergent, LGBTQI plus groups, activists, and the everyday user, for example. Intentional inclusion mechanisms must look beyond the common topics and include spaces to discuss social political issues such as ethics, social justice, climate change, digital waste, and the side of the internet we do not see every day, such as the sacrifices people make to ensure that the internet functions as it does for the rest of us to stay connected. On this side of the web, every person can proudly say, I am a digital citizen.
Are you a digital citizen? Yes, I am. I am a digital citizen because I am an active internet user. I'm a digital citizen because I use digital gadgets. I have digital cable TVs in my house. I have digital TVs. I have digital computers. I use digital phones. I even have a digital camera which I use in taking pictures when I go out for fun. Uh, that makes me a digital citizen. I would call myself a digital citizen. I'm from Honduras and I would definitely call myself a digital citizen. I'm a digital citizen. Yes, I'm a digital citizen. Hi, my name is Ria Wakar and I'm a digital citizen. Uh, yes, I'm a digital citizen. I use the internet. I have Android, I have gadgets. I engage in social media, so that makes me a digital citizen. My name is Ali Samusa. Yes, I am a digital citizen. Yeah, I'm a digital citizen because I use mobile phones in browsing. Are you a digital citizen? Yes. yes. It was formed in 2017 by the Internet Society Youth at IGF Fellow. This the um, Iceland Youth at IGF program is one of the is Hi. prominent fellowship. Program. Thank you very much everyone. Um that was on this side of the web, a short film. Um we have about ten more minutes to take questions, comments, suggestions, feedback. And just before I open the floor for that, um, a brief summary of what you have seen here today, like I said earlier on, was an input from our community members and our personal organizational research into the core issues that young people from underrepresented communities face as they try to become digital citizens. So, um, yeah, so it was a very interesting project for us because we have, as we said, a community all over the world. We are working with underrepresented youth. And when it comes to spaces like this, how do we ensure that the voices in these local communities are heard and are also taken as knowledge that we can use? So thank you all for, for watching. And I'm also acknowledging everyone online, um, acknowledging the, also the technical difficulties, but you can also find it on YouTube. So I'm now opening it to the floor for any questions, comments, and feedback. Thank you. Anyone? Amazing. about the, um, the concept of digital citizen, because at the beginning, I was wondering why people were saying that they weren't a digital citizen and whether that was a vocabulary thing, like they wouldn't use that term or, or what. And so I had that question. And then I think the film then went through the different reasons why people mightn't call themselves that in, in lots of different ways. And then at the end, really, came back perfectly to people who would say that about themselves and why. So I really love that and I hope that that stays in, in the future iterations of the film. And thank you very much for your work. Thank you very much for your comment, Brandy. And just to follow up on what you've said, initially we realized that even the concept of making use of digital devices was a bit foreign to some really disconnected youth. So even asking them, um, how they understand this digital citizenship was something that they couldn't entirely relate to. But like you said, it's good to see that some people would also recognize how they can participate meaningfully online, even not even a professional place, but an, as an everyday user by just having access to digital tools and technologies. Um, any other questions, comments, suggestions, feedback? Um, anything online? Okay. Um, all right. Thank you all very much. I guess you can. Uh, we have uh, hand raised. Okay. All right. Let's take the online comments, please. Yeah, just for us to know what they're saying because of the language is 
Thank you very much, Sarah, for that feedback. Um, in creating these videos, we tried to make it 100% accessible to the community members so that they feel comfortable to share in languages that they are fluent in. But we also realized that there's a need to put translation so that anybody from the global community who is supposed to consume the content is able to understand. And that is something that we would definitely consider in future iterations. Thank you very much once again, Sarah. All right, we have one more question, please. Um, okay, um, just before we take the in-person question, let's take the one online. Thank you. Uh, so, Lola is asking, uh, speaking in the broader sense of addressing issues in digital equality and inclusion, what role do you see of creative means like movies and other media projects playing in the advocacy and awareness raising? That's a good question, Lily. Thank you so much for asking that. Um, when it comes to producing content, uh, movies and the rest, we find out that in the world that we live in right now, people find it way easier to consume video content. I mean, we have seen how um, recently trends on videos on TikTok and um, people are using that more for searching rather than Google um, search. So that is um, producing this kind of media and sharing our research through media. It's really good for us and when it comes to putting out our work. Um, although there's still the issue of consuming the content because not many people may have access to stream YouTube and for up to 30 minutes. That's actually a luxury that should be considered. But um, yeah, we definitely would be exploring different kinds of ways to put out this work. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I think I'll add to that. I think um, the main issue that we're also trying to highlight is that whose voices do we listen to and how can we bridge that gap? So a lot of voices that we listen to when it comes to internet governance, infrastructure, and the digital divide is from people who have the internet. And so even when we're getting the different languages in, it's sort of telling a story that there are people who exist. It's not just about numbers, there are people behind it. And so it's about making sure that the voices of the grassroots, the voices of those who would otherwise not hear from are included included and media is one way that we can do that obviously there's a lot of challenges being um, a grassroots organization uh, to create like high high level content but we wanted to show that this is our reality we can't create a mirage or present something that is not actually true on the ground people have challenges to access electricity they have had challenges to access high tech uh, or phones that have uh, high-tech cameras. So I think just showing it as it is helped us like, this is the reality we're living in. And I think that's the beauty of it, yeah. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, we have an in-person input and we can take that now. Thank you very much. I was actually just going to add um, on that question, on, on the comment of um, having um, trans transcripts, tr transcriptions on, on the video. Maybe it could also just be like an instrument that uh, shows the reality of Africans. Someone in the video spoke about not uh, uh, sharing her views in English in, um, in Zulu, Isikosa. Um, and it's like, Maybe also people should see it and see like when they can't understand French or Swahili and see that this is our lived reality. We don't understand. It's in English. I'm not a digital citizen because what are you guys talking about? What is happening? And so it's, it's also like an instrument of advocacy that is living and like you can see it and people can experience it, how it is to be muted, that parts of that video, you didn't understand what is happening. So maybe that's, I think, a brilliant way of like viewing it. Thank you very much. That's actually a really, really excellent suggestion and input. I really like your perspective on how, because um, as a native English speaker, I 
pretty much take for granted my ability to just understand most of the content that is online, but um, realizing how difficult it may be to consume content that is not in a language that is native to you. And that happens to be the reality of most people who are not currently connected. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter, for that. And I would just add, like, yes, for us to bridge the digital divide, it's also, like, a very colonial concept because you have to learn English or French or any of the major languages in order to be able to engage. So how can we create an equitable internet that also embraces our diversity, our ling linguistic diversity? So that, that was an amazing comment. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And um, yes, any other further questions or comments about this short film can be passed on to us. We really appreciate your time. I'm going to pass over to Esther now to take the closing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you to everyone who joined us here in person and also online. I think that the work of our community that we do at Digital Grassroots is really to bring the voices of young people from underrepresented communities and their knowledge into spaces like this to say that we exist and our our words matter, our lives matter, and that it is very crucial that when we're building the digital future, that it is not dictated by corporations or by people who are already in a privileged position. So we are very excited. Uh, if you want to learn more about us, you can find out more. We have some flyers and we have a booth at the, uh, at the booth village. So thank you so much for coming and have a lovely Internet Governance Forum. Thank you.